An interesting title, this Adam's Chair, I don't have my chair today, of music and worship, is in some ways a rather normal combination, although the two fields are not absolutely linked. There is certainly music that is not intended for worship, and there is, music, and there is worship that is devoid of audible music. There is, however, a long history and vibrant present of music serving as part of worship. And then there is also the all too frequent occurrence of music being the thing that is being worshipped, both in and out of the church. Make no mistake, Miss Cyrus and Mr. Bieber are both worshipping something when they present their musical acts. And there are also many idolatrous fans who make them the object of their worship. Those who lift up Bach and Beethoven as musical deities are worshipping something very different from what the intentions of those composers were when they wrote their music. So I'm glad to be called to this place to help us think seriously about how these two powerful forces come together and how to bring our community into a vibrant life that creates both worship and music with integrity and passion. The confluence of music and worship is something that Joel also works very hard at, as evidenced by Friday's chapel service, which was wrapped in musical expression, and the ongoing commitment of the worship teams at Westmont. It is something that touches our community in a variety of ways, as evidenced by the work of the choirs, the orchestras, the Vespers team, and in sync, along with many of your individual music and worship endeavors that you engage in week by week. Hopefully, your experiences here at Westmont will be filled with opportunities to discover more about music and worship, both as they combine and when they do not. Discovery is an important part of that experience. If you recall the psalm we just sang a few minutes ago, it tells us to sing a new song. That implies discovery. One thing we may discover is what is new for some of us is old for others. Perhaps the organ at the service of commitment last week was new to some of you. There are plenty of churches in our culture without organs these days, although that was the norm of musical expression for the better part of some 700 years of the Western church, and still remains so in many places today. Perhaps the electric guitars were a bit surprising to you when you walked in on Monday. I know they were to me after some 50 years of all acoustic worship before coming to Westmont. Our musical gifts and experiences may be different and our worship traditions may be varied, and that's okay. Our differences most likely extend beyond the music of worship. Those differences likely extend to the ways we understand some of the other actions of worship, like the celebration of communion that we shared last week, the length of sermons or chapel talks, the physical properties of a worship space. Gymnasiums were not common to my culture prior to my arrival at Westmont. And hopefully there are a range of differences we can learn to celebrate together. Let's embrace that opportunity and enjoy the discovery. To start that, I'd like to do a little survey. The raising of hands, just one we'll do now. I'd like to know how many of you come from a non-liturgical church background? Those out there? Ah, very interesting. That's pretty amazing because in reality, and I use that word both as a uh, neutral noun and also a personal pronoun for a very popular congregation here in the city. Uh, yes, the reality of the possibility of worshiping in a non-liturgical church is about the same as living in an environment without oxygen. Both conditions are pretty much the descriptions of a complete vacuum and completely incapable of sustaining life, let alone worship. The truth of the matter is that all churches in which worship happens must be liturgical. And the truth derives from an understanding of what worship and liturgy are. Liturgy is simply the work or the actions of the people. Essentially, everything you do in worship is your liturgy. Three songs, a 45-minute sermon, and a benediction is as fixed and powerful a liturgical form as is a high Roman Catholic Mass in the Vatican or in some other place. You can attend a different or perhaps even unique liturgical tradition, but you can't participate in a non-liturgical event. Participation is your work. It is your liturgy. Even if a church changes its pattern and form of worship every Sunday, that practice in itself is the liturgy. It's inescapable. We can't worship without liturgy because there is no worship without action and work. 
Worship is an action verb. It's something that has to be done. Liturgy is something which we do. In the Christian tradition, it's something we are called to do, and more than that, it's something we are compelled to do. It's kind of like spontaneous combustion, where there is flammable material and there is heat or friction. We have fire, where there is the presence of God and we have open and earnest yearning hearts to receive that presence. There is worship. Isaiah falls down when he sees the presence of God in the temple. The elders around the throne in heaven fall down at the presence of God on the throne and hear the voice of God telling all of his servants to do likewise. The women who discovered the empty tomb fall at the feet of the risen Christ to worship him. Nowhere in scripture that I have found does it describe anywhere anyone sitting and thinking about worship or paying someone else to do it for them. It doesn't happen when the presence of God is there. Worship is an action and lit liturgy is what you do to participate in it. Now sometimes there's no mention of music and that's all right. Worship is an act of the heart, body and mind in concert but that concertizing, that concerting does not have to be musical. It does however have to be something you do. You do it. The chapel band leads you in singing. They don't sing for you. The choir sings on your behalf to God, not to you. Those who lead in prayer don't pray in your place, rather they pray aloud and you are called to follow with those same prayers in your heart. Worship does not stop when the music stops. Chapel speakers are here to inspire your path to a deeper active relationship with Jesus. Not just talk about a topic of interest or importance. Your reaction to what is said is your act of worship as they, we, I, speak. The responsorial psalm we sang this morning is a great metaphor for that dialogue. The cantor sings a phrase and the people respond with a parallel or answering phrase of praise or admonition or prayer. And responsorial song becomes the practice of liturgy or work. It's how we respond to the leadings, in that case, the song of the leader. Why is work important in this way? I can think of two, word, two reasons. One returns to the meaning of the words of worship. In this case, the very word worship. It comes from the English term worthy -ship, to give back, to give back to someone who is worthy. And certainly we sing the songs, worthy to be praised, and worthy is the Lamb. It's true God is worthy of our best and most committed responses to his glorious presence and amazing grace. Qualities like enthusiasm, energy, passion, and intellect all come into play as we offer those responses. But it's work, and the liturgy or work takes discipline. It's something we have to commit ourselves to doing. By honoring that commitment, we get stronger and more capable and in finding more joy in doing it. The practicing of worshiping shapes our spiritual conditioning, just like weightlifting shapes our physical bodies. A Latin phrase for this phenomenon of our work shaping who we are is lex orangi, lex credendi. As you do, so will you believe. We know that what we spend our time on resources on will shape our hearts. Matthew shares this insight of Jesus on this topic with the words, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you spend it on worthless things, it will be soon completely lost. The same is true of your time. Westmont calls you to invest your time wisely here in Murkison Gym three times a week. You are also called to participate in a local congregation other than Bedside Baptist. Sort of like 60 milligrams of vitamin C is the minimum daily requirement for basic bodily function. You might consider the minimum weekly requirement, MWR, for worship to be just this gathering and an opportunity for Sabbath on Sunday. It might not be enough to snap you out of a cold spell. That might take a thousand milligrams. But it will help keep you healthy in normal circumstances. Investing wisely does not mean showing up, laptop or phone in hand. It means showing up and working physically, spiritually, intellectually, bringing mind, soul, and body to every chapel and exercising them all because all three are the liturgy that is the work that you are called to employ. It is human nature and it is God's plan to remind us that we need to repeat these experiences regularly. 
The weekly Sabbath, as called for in Scripture, has been strictly observed as a model in the Jewish and many Christian communities for centuries, even though we may understand that commandment in different ways, in different traditions. Christ's invitation to share his memory and presence in the meal at the table as often as we like is another, even though we may share it in different ways and with a varied understanding and frequency. The historic monastic practice of daily hourly worship is another tradition, and chapel just three times a week during the school year, not counting finals week or holidays, and with a few exceptions for convocations, is another. That we worship is essential. How we worship is another matter. Historically and culturally, these things change. In 20th century America, Many Christian worshipers would have been highly distracted or perhaps even disdainful uh, for someone falling down on their knees, except when they had those little cute little padded things ready for you, you know, in the pews. Or even completely laying out prostrate on the floor to pray. And yet in the first century, that was the most common practice. Folding hands and bowing heads was virtually unheard of, unmentioned in scripture. But the raising of hands was common even though that might have felt a bit awkward to you as we prayed together a few moments ago. At various times and in various places and still today, the use of instruments has been either thought of as essential or banned. I contend that neither is true. What is essential is that the worshiper is fully involved in the doing of worship. Here at Westmont, we intend to vigilantly pursue a rich palette of active worship not worship restricted to a given style or cultural expectation, but rather worship that is based on scriptural principles and our calling as followers of God and Jesus Christ who are worthy to be praised and for worship. I encourage you not to be limited by what you are comfortable or acquainted with, but rather expand your vocabulary as you expand your knowledge base. Just like you expand your knowledge base in your chosen field, we're called to be doctors, musicians, architects, clergy, business leaders, authors, researchers, and such things. But all of us are called to be worshipers. Grow together in that life. To do that, you will need to practice. An athlete in any sport will tell you that simply knowing how to play the game is not nearly enough to assure that you will play it well. You have to repeat the skill over and over. You have to do the drills. You have to run the intervals and follow the routine, even when you are tired, distracted, or other physical disability to reach your goal, to set the time or win the game. Worshiping is like that as well. So what if you don't feel like coming? So what if you're tired? Come, be a part. Practice doing it anyway. You will be strengthened by your commitment to the discipline of the practice. Go ahead. Use the word discipline and be a disciple. Go through your endeavor. Your actions, just of being here with the body of Christ, will shape your will. Lex orangi, lex credendi. You can become a worshiper through the act of worshiping with discipline. Scripture calls us to worship with certain practices, even though the details may not be too specific. We're told to come and eat and do this in remembrance of Jesus. And worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let's make those precious opportunities to fall at the feet of Jesus and the throne of God, whether the action is our active engagement with the hearing of the word, the words of a speaker, the joining in an expression of praise from a choir or drum set, engaging in a prayer shared through the tradition of an Eastern Orthodox hermit monk or a song by a Roman Catholic priest from the Philippines as was the first offering by the choir this morning or perhaps a Lutheran pastor from Tanzania which will be the next song the choir will share with us or even a centuries old hymn based on the book of Revelation as one of our first songs today was holy 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 or a contemporary praise expression like the one we may end our chapel with today. Know that every action in worship must be action on the part of the people assembled. It is all the liturgy of worship. I invite you to active participation in the world of worship traditions that we will share together over the next eight months. I also invite you to continue to worship today as the choir sings a wonderful Tanzanian chorus of praise in Swahili. If, by chance, 
You are not standing or dancing by the time they get to the end of this. Uh, please stand and sing our closing songs with the chapel band. <laughs>